Thank you. We are also yes, we are recording this webinar just for everyone um, to be aware of that. So um, the Health Journalism Network, just a few words about the Health Journalism Network of Internews. It's about one year old, this network, and it really brought, was brought together during the pandemic, uh, October of last year. We have about um, more than 1,100 journalists from around the world. And it's more than just journalists, it's investigative reporters, health media professionals, um, digital media innovators, filmmakers, podcasters, content producers in various platforms. And um, they do represent also very marginalized communities from around the world. And um, we bring together, we, our goal is to build a dynamic and global community of media professionals and to equip them with the tools to report health responsibly and to do so um, feeling that they have the tools to report. Sorry, my too early in the morning, I need more coffee. Anyways, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna give the word to my colleague, Dr. Jaya, and um, she will take you through this webinar. Thank you, Jaya, over to you. Thank you so much, Bea, and um, a very, very warm welcome to everyone who's uh, taken time out of your busy schedule. Jaya, we can't hear you. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you so much, Sorry. Bea. Thank you so much, Bea, and a very warm welcome to everyone who's taken time out of your schedules to join us here this evening uh, for what promises to be a really interesting and uh, may I say a unique sort of a set of discussions on the topic of reporting suicides responsibly. So we have an absolutely wonderful lineup of speakers. Um, and uh, before I introduce them, I just wanted to set the context a little bit. Uh, we're still not out of the woods as far as COVID-19 is concerned. The pandemic has killed thousands of people all over the world and there are grieving families. The loss of lives has been accompanied by the loss of businesses, by the rise in depression, anxiety, and of course, suicidal thoughts. So it hasn't really uh, uh, you know, quite dawned on people as to what the extent of the mental impact of the epidemic has been on people. And scholarship will no doubt be generated on that topic. But in the meantime, we've pulled together this webinar to get a handle on how journalists can report on suicide, particularly in the context of COVID-19. And we have, uh, to, to start the discussion off, we have Dr. Samitra Pathari from the Center for Mental Health Law and Policy in Pune. He's the director of the center. He's a, a very well-known, highly reputed consultant psychiatrist. And uh, he was responsible also for uh, a, a, a drafting India's Mental Health Care Act, which takes a right-based based approach to mental health care for the first time in the country. He was the member of the Mental Health Policy Group appointed by the Government of India to draft India's National Mental Health Policy, which was released about six years ago. And he served as a WHO consultant in very many countries. And uh, he is currently involved in a number of interesting projects, uh, one of which is India's first mental health observatory which records and reports data on mental health conditions, including interesting things for journalists, such as tracking the expenditure on mental health in some states of the country. Part of the uh, good work that the Center for Mental Health Policy in, and, and Law in Pune does is a, a special interest on media engagement. They've come out with absolutely wonderful advocacy materials for journalists, including a course on reporting suicides responsibly, which we, we're going to see a demonstration of that course. Uh, Dr. Samsara is joined by his colleagues at the, uh, from the Center for Mental Health Law and Policy. We have uh, Ms. Jasmine Kala, who is a, uh, a researcher and a program manager. She's a research fellow at the center, and she's going to be demonstrating the course for us. And we also have Ms. Neera Damji, who's a communications lead at the center, and a veteran radio journalist herself, who spent more than 12 years with Radio Mirchi. Uh, and it's, it's fabulous that we have uh, you know, a journalist inputs also, along with those of mental health experts to create training resources for journalists. Um, along with our esteemed colleagues from the Center for Mental Health Law and Policy Pune, we're joined by Tanmoy Goswami from India. He's a 
a highly respected journalist who's done some excellent reporting on mental health. And he runs his own um, a special independent platform on mental health journalism, journalism, and it's called Sanity by Tanmoy. And we'll hear more about that as we go along. We're also very, very pleased to welcome Ms. Glynis Horning from South Africa. She's an award-winning South African journalist, uh, again, who's here to share an up-close and personal brush with suicide. Some, uh, uh, some it, it's going to be a special session and we absolutely look forward to it. Uh, after we hear from Tanmoy and Glynis, we're going to go on to the uh, demonstration of the suicide reporting course. Uh, but let's let's get this discussion started. And I'll begin by asking Samitra a few questions on why is it that you feel suicide needs to be seen as a public health issue? We're so used to the media doing these one-off reports on, a, on the suicide of someone very, very well known, or you know, a bunch of students uh, sort of uh, taking their own lives in the wake of bad exam results and so forth. Uh, what is it that's different about viewing suicide as a public health issue? And how do journalists go about researching it or what kinds of angles can they follow, Samatra? Thanks, Jaya. Thanks, uh, Bea, for this invitation and to interviews for arranging all of this. So to, to answer your question, Jaya, uh, let's just uh, put some numbers on it and put things into perspective. Uh, the first and foremost thing is that, you know, close to about 800,000 people or even more, maybe a million people every year across the world die of suicide. Uh, you know, it is in the top 10 causes of death. Very often the number of people dying by uh, suicide will be much more than many other medical conditions. Uh, so, so the, this is a large, uh, large cause of death. And and what is more worrying is that in many countries, including India, and uh, in many low income, low and middle income countries, uh, suicide tends to be something that is a problem of young people. So, like for example, in India. Uh, suicides are the number one cause of death for young women aged 18 to 39. You know, it's ahead of maternal mortality rate, uh, the suicide rate for young women. Uh, for young men of the same age, uh, suicides tend to be a number two cause of death in India. And this is world over. These, these are very high numbers for young people, especially in low and middle income countries. The other uh, problem that we find very often is that whenever you talk about suicide, or especially when journalists talk about suicide, uh, they tend to just uh, kind of uh, conflate suicides with mental health problems. Uh, now, if you look at the data, and there's also recently some data, interestingly, from, from the US too, which basically shows that less than half of the people who die by suicide will have a diagnosable mental illness. You know, and this is especially true in low and middle income countries. So less than half of the people will have a mental health problem. So what are these other problems which are related to suicide? Uh, domestic violence, unemployment, uh, you know, alcohol, uh, very closely linked to, to suicides. A third of male suicides in India have alcohol uh, as, as a kind of precipitating or preceding cause. A third of women's suicides in India uh, have a history of domestic violence. Uh, so, you know, the, and unemployment, just to give you people a little understanding that uh, in Greece, after the 2008 crisis, you know, after the economic crisis, uh, after a time lag in 2009, 10, 11, and 12, suicide rates in Greece went up by 20, 30, 40%. Uh, so clearly economic factors, unemployment also impact on suicide rates and they're, and they're not purely a health problem. So what we want people to really take upon is to understand that it's a broad public health issue with a lot of uh, social underpinnings for why suicides happen in the country. And here is uh, you know, the, the proof of the pudding, so as to speak. Uh, is there is a wonderful study which came out from Brazil, which found that if you did cash transfers for suicide, you know, if you if you had cash transfers, so the poor in Brazil uh, getting cash transfers, and what they found is that the people who got cash transfers over a 12-year period, suicide rates dropped by 60%. So again, an intervention which is not a mental health intervention is actually a cash transfer and economic intervention. So, you know, it's, it's a broad public health issue which requires public health interventions. 
and as you know very well public health is not restricted to just purely health interventions you would do interventions across different sectors and so that's why i think uh, you know it's important that we try and understand the the complexity of suicide i get very worried when i see reports which reduce suicide down to a single factor uh, it never is a single factor you know there's always a multiplicity of factors because it's uh, that the challenge is why this person died by suicide at this point in time by this method and that really is the challenge that one needs to try and understand when one is reporting most of the reports we seeing in the media somitra exactly like how you described it's always about a person and the reasons for why that person may have taken their lives and a lot of description and conjecture including very intrusive interviews with the relatives but what you're describing is that the roots of suicide uh, extend far beyond just a, a an, an one off instance that's not the way to look at it but we need to look at these larger uh, multiple factors including poverty and deprivation um and which leads to depression and so on and something as simple as a cash transfer which can alleviate hunger or uh, increase uh, you know put a little money into people's pockets so that they feel more secure and can buy some food or medication might actually make a difference um do you think that other public health issues such as having a chronic disease for instance like tuberculosis which is so widespread in asian countries or um a something like a, a chronic diabetes or a, or a heart disease is that linked to suicide in some way these are other large public health issues as well yeah of course you know see i'll tell you what happens jaya is that all of these things are interlinked with each other so you know tuberculosis is linked with poverty for example poverty is linked to suicide tuberculosis is linked to suicide so many of these factors it's a complex interplay of multiple factors which interact with each other uh you know poverty might mean that you don't get proper treatment for your health problems and then that makes you more prone to getting depression uh and then that depression makes you more prone to becoming uh, uh you know attempting or dying by suicide uh so what i want to encourage uh, journalists really to do is to try and understand that these are that there is a complexity to the whole thing and that's why i get very worried when uh, a lot of the discourse around suicide is a little bit like oh he he did something to a did something to b and so b died of suicide and a is responsible i you know it life is not so simplistic as that when it comes to suicide and to the need to understand those complexities when you're doing that uh and and you know just to you know you'd say but why should journalists bother i mean why should journalists have an interest in all of this uh and there is a reason why journalists i think uh, should have an interest there is now a lot of research from across the world which shows that uh, uh, how we report suicides in the media uh, can actually impact the number of suicides so the research puts it as 1 to 2 persons you could say 1 to 2 persons lives just by having more responsible reporting of suicides uh now 1 to 2 persons in the international context you are looking at 8000 to 16000 lives uh considering that there are 800000 suicides so uh, you know just reporting suicides responsibly and doing it in a proper way will make a huge difference let me give you an example of how uh you know not so good reporting can have a problem uh, after robin williams suicides uh in that area where newspaper reports were carried about his suicide uh rates of suicide using the same method that robin williams used went up by 30% in the subsequent 6 months so so clearly you know celebrity suicides are a different uh, particular issue and they need to be reported extremely carefully and sensitively these copycat suicides are uh, uh, very uh, increasingly well recognized i think about the media there is a growing awareness about the need to avoid describing the method of suicide and so on we've seen several instances of that uh but somitra my my challenge really is as as a journalist too if we uh, are looking at the multifactorial um, you know sort of underpinnings of suicide and they extend across a wide range of issues uh, where would a journalist go to for data or where would the journalist learn how to weave these different pieces together i mean you can't imply causality when none exists uh, through a simple linear sort of you know poop poop 
adding two and two and coming up with six. Uh, so I, and, and it's so much easier to sort of focus on the sensational aspects of a particular case and ride the emotions surrounding that event. And that always grabs eyeballs in, in today's very, very competitive uh, social media and media industry. So where would a journalist, uh, you know, sort of find the tools to reason through pulling the piece together based on the multifactorial context that you just described? I mean, there are plenty of sources. I think the, the first and important uh, source is the internet. I mean, if you just, uh, uh, you know, spent a little time and did your research on the internet, you will find lots of articles. I mean, academic articles, uh, articles written by academicians for the lay public, which talk about all of these issues and which put things into context. So that's one source of information. The other source of information, obviously, is uh, talk to professionals, uh, people who work in the sector. Uh, the third source of information is there are organizations internationally and nationally which work on suicide prevention. And if you go to their websites, you'll find a lot of information. So, you know, the WHO has a whole whole lot of information about suicides from across the world. In fact, they have an entire theme they've started on suicide prevention now, so you'll be able to find it there. Uh, the International Association of Suicide Prevention has a lot of information on their website. Uh, organizations like ours will also be putting out information about suicide prevention. So, so that's another source of information. And the third source of information, obviously, is uh, talk to the professionals. You know, Call up someone, have a chat with them, uh, try and understand the complexity uh, around it. Uh, so, I, I think there's there's you know there's a lot of that information around. I think it just uh, requires a certain amount of uh, uh, sensitivity and effort in trying to piece it all together. Uh, if I were to use uh, uh, examples like India, for example, uh, you know if people who are on the line from India, for example, Sainath and his group at the Pari Network have a whole host of data about farmer suicides in India and lots of reporting around it and histories around it. So you can always go up and it's free to access. You can go into their uh, library, look it up online and everything. So, so there is a lot of information. I think it just requires people to uh, realize that this is a complex issue which requires a more, uh, a more nuanced kind of writing rather than a very simplistic A led to B kind of a discussion. Um, absolutely, Samadra, and thank you for flagging up the farmer suicides uh, sort of phenomenon in India, which is, which is a chronic thing, which is getting increasingly better reported, if I may say so. There's better data that's being collected by organizations like uh, Sainats. Um, uh, so I, I think that that sort of set the stage for this. Uh, we need to go to different places to get data. Uh, there are reputed websites. There's a lot of published scholarship around suicide as a public health issue uh, that scientists have published. And we need to reach out to the experts on the ground to get a better idea and um, have good mentoring, I think, by mental health professionals who can sort of move the journalist away from reporting on suicide as a one-off event and, and direct the attention towards uh, uh, the larger context in which suicides are taking place. Uh, there was also another interesting thing that you flagged up, which is the need for um, uh, a more complex set of interventions and a policy approach um, and, and programs that need to address these uh, instances, the growing instances of suicide, particularly among young people. And, and, and I'll leave you with a question, but I'll come back to it later. Mental health professionals deal with severe anxiety, depression, and people who've maybe attempted suicide and come out of it. So we're dealing only at the uh, end of the spectrum after all the other uh, causes have happened because of maybe poor economic policies or deprivation or caste discrimination or class discrimination, violence or pandemics and other kinds of things which are essentially the responsibility or people handle it from the other sectors of the government like industry, uh, you know, transport, agriculture and so on. So uh, we're left literally putting these band-aids on coffins at the end of it. Uh, so we, but we'll come back to that and see how journalists can approach it from, I mean, get these other policymakers alerted to this. Thank you so much, uh, Saumitra, for those uh, absolutely wonderful remarks. It's absolutely set the stage uh, for this. And 
And uh, now we're going to move on to um, introducing our two uh, star speakers for the evening, more star speakers. It's a stellar lineup all round. But we have with us uh, Ms. Glynis Horning from South Africa, uh, who's an award-winning freelance writer. And uh, she's covered um, the apartheid um, issues in South Africa um, and also covered issues related to uh, refugees in, in Rwanda, in the refugee camps of Rwanda and Zaire, in, in uh, Rwandan refugee camps in Zaire, from the Amazon jungle to ice flows in Patagonia. She's been all over the world in some of the most uh, outlandish and interesting places on the planet. Horning is also the recipient of the Discovery Health Journalism Award for the Best Health Consumer Reporting and Feature Writing, the Pfizer Mental Health Journalism Award, and she's also the recipient of a Rosalind Carter Fellowship for Mental Health Journalism. Uh, she's been the Galliova Health Writer of the Year in not only 2017, but also in 2019 and 2020. And uh, we're so pleased, Glynis, to welcome you here. Um, uh, the reason Glennis is here to share her thoughts with us is that uh, to share the experience of what it's been to lose a grown son, aged 25, who died by suicide. And uh, Glennis has sort of written about it and shared her feelings uh, through her book called Waterboy, Making Sense of My Son's uh, Suicide, which has been uh, released recently. It's available on, um, you can order it on Amazon as well. But Linus, thank you so much for giving of your time and uh, thank you so much for being willing to share your thoughts with us. We also have uh, Tanmoy Goswami, uh, a, a very well-recognized mental health uh, journalist from India who uh, runs an independent journalism platform devoted to mental health. It's called Sanity by Tanmoy. And uh, Tanmoy is a suicide attempt survivor himself Tanmoy, thank you so much for coming to this event and for being so gracious enough to share your thoughts with us. So let me just um, begin by asking you both, um, what, the, what has the experience been? Can you just describe your personal experience with this? Maybe we'll start with Glynis. What was that personal experience um, that you had with suicide and um, how did that make a difference? difference how did how did what kind of a change did you feel Glynis I think you have to unmute yourself Glynis I just wanted to yeah, start by reading an extract from the book just to say at the outset that it gives details that I would not have included if I was writing a piece about the subject or say a newspaper or a magazine. Um, but a book gives you the space and you can find the context and the complexity of the issue, which we've just heard explained to us. Um, and I wanted to share this with you because I think if I have a purpose being here at all this, this evening or this afternoon, um, it's to maybe give you some insight into the emotional state um, and the mind of the family, what goes through their heads in the immediate aftermath of a suicide. So if you are a journalist reporting on it, you have a bit of a sense of what the people are going through. So it might just help you in terms of sensitivity when you reach out. So I'm just going to start from the book where I say, it was a very, very ordinary Sunday afternoon and I was, no, Sunday morning, in fact, and I was reading the newspapers in bed ahead of my editing shift. Um, and as I say, I'm relaxed and more content than in a long while. Then I sense Chris, it's my husband, standing motionless at our bedroom door. Glenn, he says at last in a clear, strangled voice, Spencer is dead. Three words, heart heaves, bowels, not synapses fire. I shoot from bed to door and down the stairs to our boy's little flat. He could be asleep, lying against a pile of cushions, sculpted mouth slightly ajar, small flick of pink foam at one corner, beautiful blue-gray eyes, half closed as if in meditation. As always, he's only in boxer shorts, and as I reach down and take him in my arms, his alabaster skin is cold. Already bruising shadows his limbs, where blood 
no longer pumped by that big heart, he cooled and cooled. There's not a mark on him, not a clue around him, not a pill box or wrapper, just an empty McDonald's cup and an ice cream container beside him, like when he occasionally felt ill as a child and thought he might throw up. My left brain knows he's dead. I've seen enough forensic series and enough real dead people, including my husband's father, who died moments before Spencer and I could reach him on a late night dash to the hospital. Spencer and I had held each other at the bedside and wept. Now, I hold him and I can't weep. I can't breathe. But wait, I am breathing. Those great noisy gasps are coming from me as my right brain grinds into denial. Perhaps that boy's only in a coma. Perhaps he's still alive. Call an ambulance, call the police. I sprint to my office and try frantically to phone, misdialing, swearing, starting to come undone. Then our second son, our slender, dark-eyed Ewan, and his elfin girlfriend are there, wrenched into wakefulness in this new world of panic and pain, and they're phoning for me. I tear back to Spencer to hold him, to be with him as long as I can, to stroke his soft, sandy hair and cool, smooth skin, to wipe the pink fleck from his pale lips, and the next, it wells slowly, and the next. Vans arrive, men and women in uniforms, lead me outside while they examine him, photograph him, oh God, bag him. Huddled at our garden gate, we watch in disbelief as a mortuary van turns into our yard and they feel out our boy on a stretcher and load him into the back. And he is gone, gone. And that's when all the turmoil and the self-questioning and the self-recrimination sets in. Dennis, thank you so much. I really appreciate that you shared this with us and uh, absolutely appreciate it. Thank you so much. And I must apologize on behalf of all of us because I know what an extractive kind of an experience this must be. Uh, I absolutely appreciate it. H how did you get through this, Glynis? How did you and your family make it through this? You know, the most important things for us, on the one hand, it was actually reaching out to other people and sharing the experience. And that's why the stigma around this needs to be broken. Um, from the very first night, I found I was WhatsApping my three best friends in the world from school days, one in Copenhagen, one in St. Louis in the States, and one down in the Cape. And they would come back to me from very different perspectives. One was an English lecturer, one was a, a counselor, you know, the other one had worked for UNICEF and they would come back with their views and then I could pour it out to them. So sharing, reaching out to understanding and empathetic others was amazing. That was the biggest, and the, those exchanges of emails and, and WhatsApp messages became the backbone for the book, Water Boy. But beyond that, it was little practical things. From the first day, my husband and I, he's not well either, we're swimmers. So, we carried on, we would make ourselves get up, get out of bed, drive to the pool and swim 40 lengths a day. It's little things like that. It's almost, it's your habits um, and, and just cold water. I, I, I'm sure that the medical professionals will know this business about how the vagus nerve is apparently very important. It's part of what helps to relax your system and it's linked to things like your diaphragm when you breathe deeply and apparently cold water stimulates it. So, little things I mean I think swimming and the repetitive nature of it and the meditative nature of it helps so it's it's repetitive habits that help but mostly it's the support that you get from other people and then we, we did have professional help because my boy had been treated for he had a major depression and he had generalized anxiety disorder and he had a, a blood condition not a serious one he had what is called thalassemia minor not thalassemia major so he had slightly misshapen blood cells red blood cells, so he didn't have enough oxygen. So he suffered from fatigue and it was hard to get his energy up. So we had, we had, he had had professional help from him. He'd been on medication and we had those resources to tap into. But I try and get the word, word out to people in my country, where in South Africa, we have 23 suicides a day. That's virtually one an hour. And they say for every one suicide that is completed, there are many attempts. 
And so in our country, we've got a, a wonderful organization called SADAG, the South African Depression and Anxiety Support Group. So uh, when I write about this sort of thing, I advocate for people to, to reach out because there's many people in my country who cannot afford to go the professional route to just go off and see a psychologist or psychiatrist. So if they can go through SADAG and get referrals and then get their places in the long state queues, it helps them. So those were, and reaching out and, and maybe getting people to look at those alternatives and helping others hopefully through the book um, has been also one of my ways of coping with this. I hope that's of some help. Absolutely, because um, I think uh, apart from learning to understand the broader dimensions of suicides and the context in which suicides take place, it's equally important for journalists to connect people to help, to uh, let them know that there are community-based groups uh, or people out there who are willing to make their time and energies and emotions available to help you get through uh, this loss. Um, if there are special tips that you would like to sort of offer reporters based on your own experience as to how suicides may be reported um, more sensitively or in a more helpful fashion, uh, what would you say those would be? I think the big thing is what I've appreciated when people have reached out to, to me and have, have, have actually run pieces about this is where they obviously you start off by expressing some kind of human connection with, with the person. They don't just phone up and I'm doing a story on whatever, or I believe your child has died. You know, it's a bit more, a bit more warmth and empathy that goes a long way. And then one needs, obviously, if you're going to open up, if somebody in family maybe is going to open up to have some kind of rapport and some kind of trust established. And um, that that's very important. And, and from my point of view, what I would suggest to people to, um, I know normally in most forms of journalism, it's totally anathema, but I would want that journalist because of something so sensitive, I'm going to speak about something as close to me as this. I'm going to want them to run that by me. I wouldn't change anything that's factually correct or whatever, but I would want the reassurance of knowing that was going out, there was not going to be some sensational rubbish. And I'd want to have a little bit of control over that. So I would offer the person maybe the chance to do that. And being aware that also, if you speak to just one family member, they might give you a view, and then what you write might still hurt other family members who don't share that point of view. And certainly what the first person spoke about today, um, the idea of simplifying it. Why did your child die? Do you know what caused it? You have to go into this whole thing about it's very complicated and explain, you know, and, and the three legs to my son's suicide and the fact that there are so many factors one will never know altogether what exactly it was finally, what the final driver was, and just the, the importance of being, yeah, being sensitive and understanding how many people are going to read what you say and not allowing this whole copycat thing to start. That's why, as I said, although I shared the details in what I've written in a book context, um, I can see the danger of writing a piece that outlines exactly, you know, the old thing of Kate Spade put a, a scarf around her neck and hanged herself in the back of a hotel door. You don't want to go into that because it kind of opens the door to copycat problems, yeah. Um, so I, I would be very circumspect in what personal details about the setting and what exactly happened um, in my reporting on it, and maybe focus on also on celebrating the life of the person if you can. <laughs> and you can't put all suicides, obviously, but everybody is different. Everybody is different. But to be able to celebrate something of, of the person and and what they might have left behind, because especially when a child dies, it's a parent's future. It's everything they put their love and hope and trust into for the future, and it's gone. So it's, it's, it's a heavy burden, it really is, it's, it's a difficult path to walk. And there are other close family members, I, you know, my, my boy who went, he's got a younger brother and his, his father has got a Parkinson's. So, you know, there are other people to consider. So when you write a piece, just be sensitive to what responsibility you carry. Very valuable guidance, uh, Glynis, thank you so much. Um, I'm, now going to turn to Thanmoy to 
share your own experiences what was your personal experience and and uh, what really happened tanmoy um thank you thank you dr shridhar into news um and glennis um just overwhelming listening to you um just wanted to uh, also serve a, a standard trigger warning in case anything i say uh, triggers anybody please do uh, feel free to step out or seek help um it's a it's a complex question and a funny one uh, what exactly happened because it's not uh the, the experience of suicidality is a uh, sort of like groundhog day for me um it's it's not an event that happened once and then never happened um and it's also very difficult to etch out the antecedents and what exactly happened on a particular day um but i have lived with this for uh, well um uh, my entire adult life um i live with uh, depression and anxiety and there have been several instances where i've come very close to the brink and rescued by uh, some phenomenal therapists um and uh, psychiatrists and of course a very close circle of uh, uh, friends and support system um i think the uh, the gravity of it all and the fact that i was not just you know in a um, this was not just a dalliance um Uh, struck me when i became a father about 3 uh, years ago um and uh, there was a uh, particular day that i remember very very uh, 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 clearly um where i was completely lost and i was i could i could almost see myself walking towards uh, something irreversible and uh, my infant who was 2 years old then just sort of came uh running out from the house because he had caught an insect that he wanted to show me um and that kind of brought me back from that state um i often talk about this experience because i also as a father feel very keenly the unfairness of uh, this uh, of of parental uh, uh you know suicidality on young children um you know i in no way want my child to grow up thinking that he has to be my savior or something so um but it does help to be connected to a community of people that, that have given me the language uh the tools to initiate this conversation hopefully when he is in a uh, you know when he's slightly older it's something that i do intend to talk about because um i have realized that uh a suicide as with all sorts of other stigmatized human experiences really grow in you know in the damp dark corners where light and air and and talk and connection don't reach um and so i don't want to uh wait for uh, somebody else or the internet to give him that information i would like to have a conversation about death and dying with him when he is a uh, reasonably older and then as a journalist um i was a business journalist for uh, almost the entirety of my uh, professional career and then like i said once my son was born i was going through a particularly obnoxious spell of depression um i had to quit my job i was writing a book i had to return the advance um and i was uh, locked up in my room for over a year and then um uh, just before he was born i was feeling better i started working again um but i realized after he was born that i couldn't work in mental health part time any longer i could no longer just you know write a few linkedin posts and a few tweets i had to do something in it full time and that's where my journey started as a professional journalist and uh, i always take a lot of uh, pains to communicate that when i write about suicide i don't write about suicide i write about suicide prevention um and that is very important because you know for all the reasons that everybody else has already touched upon um it is not the event that interests me or it is not the you know it's not the uh, news value of a death that interests me uh, what interests me is how all these uh, conversations can aggregate to saving lives there is nothing more important uh, to me as a mental health journalist as a human being and i believe my personal experiences have led me i think to that to that realization uh, tanmoy uh, thank you for sharing that and to me it seems like the more you write about it the more you communicate about it is is that therapeutic for you is that yes. the reason which you get through this through periods of intense depression or suicidal thinking yes i think um i mean it's a it's a little risky to 
put it like this because there is a lot of romanticization of writing about your pain. Um, and, uh, you know, what I've also realized is writing uh, as, an, as an occupation and publishing as an industry, they have their own dynamic. And if you look at all the classics of mental health literature or survival literature, um, it's typically about, you know, people who have been through the worst, uh, people who have been repeatedly institutionalized, often against their will, people who have lost, near, uh, you know, uh, 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 near and dear ones, as, as Glynis has, as I have, as I'm sure a lot of other people in the audience today would have experienced that feeling. Um, I have become very aware that while these are absolutely incredibly critical works and they have paved the path for writers like me to follow in their wake, um, I'm aware that the logic of the publishing industry almost by default stops other stories from coming out, which are not necessarily, which don't necessarily meet their pain threshold, you know, so people who get up and go about their lives, uh, people who live with suicidal ideation, but may not have, I mean, who is to say what defines a suicide attempt even, right? Um, but it, it seems to me that writing about it, especially now that this is my full-time job, uh, my platform is 100% funded by readers from around the world. I have become very aware of how, you know, what I share and how I share it and what it does to things like, you know, how many people sign up to my platform. Um, so it's a very complicated dance. But yes, at a purely personal level, more than even the writing that I do on my platform as a professional journalist, social media, Twitter has been incredibly powerful, which is a paradox. I know it's a cesspit for a lot of people, including minorities, women, but the mental health nook and the suicide prevention nook of which Dr. Pathare and the CMHLP team, Meera, Jasmine, they're all part of it, has been a very big support. Um, thank you so much. Sanmoy, I know that um, uh, there might be time to read a small extract from what you've written, but can we do that after the demonstration of the course on suicides? It's, I think that um, uh, we must get along to that session. So um, I'm going to uh, thank you so much, Sanmoy, and thank you, Glynis. And I'm, I'm now going to invite Jasmine and Meera from the Center for Mental Health Law and Policy, Pune, to give us a peek into this uh, reporting suicides responsibly ecos for journalists. So Jasmine, Meera, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jaya, and thank you for inviting us. Um, just gonna request Meera to, to share her presentation on screen. <laughs> If you don't have access, I can begin, Mira, and yeah, then- I think the screen access. sharing thing has been disabled. Um, Bea, I think you'll have to just, or you'll have to give me access so that I can share the um, screen. Yes, I think it's Christoph. He'll give you access, yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. Maybe no. you can start, Jess. I can begin. Uh, don't really need the slides. All right, so um, I'm here to talk about one of the things that we've done quite recently as part of the SPIRIT intervention. This is an integrated suicide prevention uh, work that we are trying out in rural communities, uh, but we also have a capacity building core because we realize that there are lots of things that we know uh, can help in suicide prevention, but there's li little that is done to translate the knowledge to practice. Uh, and one of them being work with media professionals because they are policy influencers. And, and as we've heard, they have a huge impact on people's lives. And as Samitra had mentioned in the beginning that uh, just reporting on suicide responsibly can uh, reduce suicides up to 2%. And, um, and just to say that these 2% might seem like a small number, but these are human beings at the end of the screen uh, who are reading your stories or absorbing what you have written. So there is a lot that one could be doing in that space to, um, to change this narrative, to, to shift the way that we are writing about life and death uh, in a way that is more positive for people and, and brings about hope and reassurance. Um, so the context for us was that we started, uh, we got an opportunity last year with the recent celebrity suicide death to, to start a conversation with media professionals on, um, on, on the fact that we know we need to do something differently, but the question often was, what should we do differently? How should we do it? 
Uh, so there was this gap of practical knowledge on what are the evidence-based techniques that exist and what could we be doing to implement the same. So which is why we came up with, uh, with the short course. Uh, we realized that um, online is, is the way to go, uh, especially with the pandemic. Um, and this was also aimed at people who are um, writing, say, on social media for uh, print, digital platforms, and also students who are writing, who are just learning about journalism and, and how should they um, get introduced to the, the topic of mental health and especially suicide prevention. So we've designed an online course. It's self-paced. It's uh, hosted on an open platform where you can sign in. Uh, we, while designing the course, of course, realized that we wanted to co-design it with the community. So we did speak to um, journalism students, media professionals, experts in the field of suicide prevention, and also people with lived experience about uh, what should we be uh, putting out there for media professionals to do things differently. Uh, currently, the way the uh, course is designed is that you have about six weeks to do it. If you can complete it in six weeks, then you get a certificate of completion, but you also have access to the material, and I'll let Mira speak more to that. Um, so primarily, the objectives is if people can just get an understanding of the complexity of the issue of suicide, um, why should the media be looking at suicide reporting or suicide prevention, um, so not just a theoretical base to it or just introduction to the guidelines, but we're hoping for an attitudinal shift to come in place, which really shapes the way in which, you know, the practicalities of writing um, a report uh, work out. So some of the content, just to tell you what, what can you expect if you've signed up for the course is just to give you a brief understanding of what does suicide in India look like. But we've also had people from, um, actually across the globe, we've had people sign up for this course. So there are some similarities with low middle income country context. Um, we also like uh, have exposed one of particular session just talking about these complexities and the perspectives with which one could look at suicide so that we don't make it reductive. Um, Tanmay does, does this session about why should one talk about uh, suicide prevention in the media. Um, then we've designed a series of exercises, reflective activities to, to really put these guidelines to practice. Um, however, we do understand that there are challenges. So we've got uh, media professionals, journalists talking about their own challenges and how they have managed to navigate this space. Um, and some additional reporting guidelines that might be relevant to, uh, to media professionals, which are based on evidence. Um, last but not the least, we will also take you through a little bit about your own mental health, which is often ignored. Um, so there is enough um, trauma coming your way, enough triggers coming your way as a professional. So how can one address uh, some of those requirements? So I'll hand over to my colleague, Mira to take you through the next part. Sure, thanks Jasmine. And I want to start by saying a big thank you to the team at Internews for organizing this webinar. Thank you, Jaya, uh, Bia and Catherine, and thank you, Glynis and Tanmoy for um, talking about your experiences. Um, I thought I could talk you through the methodology um, that we've used to deliver this course because it's a very important factor considering that one, we're working with participants who come with prior knowledge of the subject and have been reporting on suicides. And two, this is a self-paced e-course. You know? So then how do you make it engaging and interactive in that sense? So the first thing is that when you sign up for the course, you fill in a pre-assessment form, which consists of multiple choice questions that are based on suicide and suicide reporting. And this is just for you to get a sense of where you are in terms of knowledge and understanding of this subject. And once you finish the course, once you've gone through all the eight modules, you take the same assessment again. So it, it tells us how effective our material is and also tells the participants if there has been a shift and we're hoping for a significant shift in their knowledge and attitudes. The other thing is that each module is in the form of a short video, which ranges somewhere between 15 to 30 minutes. Um, they're just a couple that are actually 30 minutes long. The rest are around 15 minutes and they have several other interactive elements which are integrated in those videos. Um, Every module begins with the facilitator asking a reflective question, you know, so that kind of makes the, the participant 
understand the context or think through what exactly is uh, what the context of that content of that module really is to ensure that the learning process is interactive and experiential we've also incorporated a few guided exercises within certain modules the idea is to use questions to probe you know make the participants reflect make the course more hands on rather than just show and tell why not learn by doing so whether it's about writing a headline or thinking of who to interview or like we were discussing how do you interview if somebody's lost a loved one to suicide these are um, some of the things which are covered between um, in those guided exercises at the end of every module is a quick quiz with a set of 10 questions which are based on the module content you get 10 attempts to pass the quiz and we've kept a minimum score of 7 on 10 that's 70% after which then you can move to the next module and the last thing is very important that we've included narratives of persons with lived experience throughout the course either in the form of short videos or quotes because we want to keep bringing back the focus to people people who consume these news reports so uh, these eight modules will take you around 3 and a half to 4 hours and for participants who'd like to gain a little more in depth knowledge on understanding the issue of suicide we've also included a folder with additional reading material on suicide and suicide prevention there are also few handy resources uh, like a checklist that we've put together of do's and don'ts which is based on the evidence based reporting um, suicide guidelines uh, which have been published by the who uh, this is something that you can just you know uh, print and pin to your soft board or you can download it and have it handy on your desktop so that you can keep referring to it uh, besides this particular project we at the center for mental health law and policy work on various other projects that are based on suicide prevention and one of them is about assessing newspaper articles which are on suicide or attempted suicides to see if they are adhering to who's guidelines and we do this on the basis of scorecards that we've developed which are again based on who's guidelines so there's a positive scorecard and there's a negative scorecard so the positive scorecard has all the do do's uh, on which you must aim to score a 10 on 10 and a negative scorecard is something that you must aim to score a 0 on 10 because it has all the don'ts so this is a tool which can be used by journalists to self score or rate their own articles once you know they they've written it out um just to tell you that after a month of launching this course we've had approximately 135 people sign up uh, these are journalists students of journalism independent journalists who work across different media formats and languages and around i think 35 to 40 of them have already completed the course here are a couple of quotes from uh, some of the participants who have completed the course and what's interesting is that although who had issued these guidelines long back most journalists speak about how they weren't really aware of them uh, we also talked to journalists after the course and we asked them um what would they now do differently after they've done the course after taking this and it's been encouraging to read what some of them have to say um, like you can see one of them mentions how in a hurry to be you know quote and quote exclusive one often doesn't pay attention to the, the finer details and maybe that's something that one really needs to be mindful of how are you using those words because language really matters um and then there's another journalist who contributes to online uh, publication says that you know while reporting on suicide they would now focus more on the life of the person rather than speculate the cause and the reasons for their death so that's a little bit about the course we'd like to invite everybody uh, to sign up for this as soon as i'm done i'll drop a link in the chat box that will lead you to a page like a landing page from where you can sign up for the course find more details to it just to reiterate it is available at no cost it is self paced so you can start um you know you can take the course whenever you feel like you have those 3 4 5 hours that you can dedicate to it or you can do it on weekends and divide your time accordingly uh, it's online and most importantly it's created with inputs from all stakeholders <clears throat> including suicide prevention experts <clears throat> sorry about that uh, students media professionals and most importantly people with lived experience 
Thanks so much, Jasmine and Meera. That was a uh, absolutely brisk and, and wonderful demonstration of the course as well as the scorecards. What's interesting about the scorecards is like um, uh, they seem to be like a very uh, what what can I say like a constant uh, reminder to self improve one's own writing, right? And then as you said, you can just pin it up. It's seven thirty. Sorry about that. You can just pin it up over your desk and and just keep checking your own pieces uh, against it. And then there were wonderful tips from Glynis and from Tanmoy as well. And um, a fabulous context set by Saumitra. So I think that um, at this point in time with, with all of this information buzzing around in our heads and a fresh new perspective, we're all ready to take questions from the audience if there are any. Um, any questions, please do drop them in the chat box. Alert from Yahoo, word required. If there are no questions, I'm going to ask my colleague, Bea, who had a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I think we don't have any questions, but I want to um, let everyone know that we will post the recording of this um, webinar on our uh, Health Journalism Network YouTube channel. So if you feel like others can benefit from hearing this conversation, feel free to share the link. And um, we will have a couple more of these um, webinars on mental health reporting in the coming in November. We don't have the exact date yet, but we will um, please monitor our Facebook page. We will put the dates and in there. So I think this is a, such an important topic, Jaya. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for staying around and most of all for sharing so much information, valuable information for reporters. And Tanmoy, I've wanted to meet you for a long time. And Glynis, it's such an honor. We are so pleased to have had you. And uh, I really encourage all our network members and we will share the link to the course in our newsletter because it goes out to over a thousand journalists. And I think this is a topic that touches so many people and so much is not talked about. And so reporters can really save lives and help that too. So it's really important. So I think we can, if there's no questions, I don't see any questions and also on Facebook, there's a lot of comments that we got on Twitter and also here in the chat. Um, but I think we can probably close this webinar now and um, see you all in November for our second and third, right, Jaya? Absolutely. So on, on behalf of the Health Journalism Network and Internews, uh, thank you so much to all the expert speakers from the Center for Mental Health Law and Policy, Pune, and to our wonderful uh, speakers, Glynis and, and Tanmoy. Thank you so much. So we'll see you at the next webinar. Till then, stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Everyone, bye. Bye.